Hello everyone. Welcome to another line by line analysis of one of the 20 CSEC English B poems. This week's poem, Once Upon a Time by Gabriel Okara, highlights the social, economical and political changes that sometimes alter the behavior of groups of people, making them secretive, deceptive and suspicious of others. So intrinsically, a uh, change in lifestyle, whether owing to educational and economic advancements or even to political allegiances, can really push us into imitating the behavior of our associates until we can hardly recognize ourselves. But before we delve into the poem stanzas and poetic devices, let's begin by reading the poem. Once Upon a Time by Gabriel O'Cara. Once upon a time, son, they used to laugh with their hearts and laugh with their eyes. But now they only laugh with their teeth while their eyes block whole eyes search behind my shadow. There was a time indeed they used to shake hands with their hearts. But that's gone, son. Now they shake hands without hearts while their left hands search my empty pockets. Feel at home, come again, they say. And when I come again and feel at home once, twice, there will be no trice, for then I find doors shut on me. So I have learned many things, son. I have learned to wear many faces like dresses. Home face, office face, street face, host face, cocktail face, with all their conforming smiles like a fixed portrait smile. And I have learned too to laugh with only my teeth and shake hands without my heart. I have also learned to say goodbye when I mean good riddance, to say glad to meet you without being glad, and to say it's been nice talking to you after being bored. But believe me, son, I want to be what I used to be when I was like you. I want to unlearn all these mutant things. Most of all, I want to relearn how to laugh, for my laugh in the mirror shows only my teeth like a snake's bare fangs. So show me, son, how to laugh. Show me how I used to laugh and smile once upon a time when I was like you. As it relates to the structure of the poem, the poem has 43 lines and it is divided into seven sections or seven stanzas. Stanza one to three deals with the three aspects of the new hypocrisies. Stanza four to five underscores the persona's adoption of these new hypocrisies. Stanza six emphasizes the persona's desire to undo what he or she has learned, while Stanza seven tells us about the persona's appeal for help from his or her son. The poem is also written in the first person point of view. When a poem or when a poet or a persona utilizes the first person point of view, the narrator or the persona is the person in the story, right? Telling the story from their point of view using the pronoun I. This often gives the reader a front seat to the story and gives the story credibility, which allows the reader to delve or even go deeper into the persona's mind, as we saw in the poem, A Stone Stroke. Right, so the poem is also in the form of a free verse. Uh, when we talk about free verse in poetry, it's an open form of poetry that does not use consistent meter, lines, rhyme, and pattern like the traditional poetry, and it tends to follow natural speech. Let's take a quick look at the title of the poem. The poem is called Once Upon a Time. This is how a fairy tale begins, right? Fairy tales are essential stories for childhood. Uh, these stories are more than just happily ever after tales because they, they tend to portray real moral lessons through characters and vo the virtues illustrated in the stories. They are often didactic, meaning that they, its intention is to teach and moral instruction is always an ulterior motive. motive. The persona uh, in this poem we will see feels that all your trust in behavior is equally unattainable or even unbelievable and just by hearing the person will say once upon a time, or even hearing the title once upon a time, it gives us the feeling of something that happened a long, long, long time ago. Let's begin with stanza one. So stanza one says, once upon a time, son, they used to laugh with their hearts and laugh with their eyes. And now they only laugh with their teeth while their eyes block whole eyes touch behind my shadow. So notice in line one of stanza one, there's a repetition of the title. 
the title of the poem, right? Which therefore gives us a feeling as if we are being told a fairy tale and also that feeling that this particular story or what the person is about to tell us happened a long, 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 long time ago, okay? So once upon a time, Sun, Sun there tells us that the person is speaking to a younger person, right? And it also tells us too that it doesn't have to be a case where this is the persona's biological father. It can be somebody who's older than the persona who refers to um, somebody who is younger as son, okay? So once upon a time, son, they used to laugh with their hearts. They there refers to the person as associate, friends, or persons the person um, came in contact with or associated him or herself with, okay? Because there's nothing in the poem telling us that the persona is male or female, right? Um, what it means to laugh with your heart. When you laugh in your heart, with your heart, what comes to mind is that emoji you know, there's an emoji where you're smiling and there's one that you're smiling wide, wide, wide till tears are coming out of your eyes. I think they usually call it um, rolling on the floor emoji, right? When you laugh with your heart, the idea is that it is genuine. It means that um, you always see, uh, it's always reflected in your body language. You know, you can see it in the person's eyes. It might, you know, become a bit smaller or for some people, maybe a bit wider. But it, it or when you laugh with, and your laugh is genuine, it tends to be, it felt okay so the person says that long ago this is this is what happened when we communicate or interact with other people they used to laugh with their hearts and notice that they used to laugh with their eyes okay you, you couldn't laugh without the person's eyes or somebody's eyes quinting right becoming small or you know their entire face just went on an action or went on fire okay but now but now there shows that there's a contrast being made between what happened then and what's happening now so, but now they only laugh with their teeth. So when they suggest that when somebody crack a joke or a joke is being told, the person who is listening, they will fake laugh. You know, they will force the laugh. It's not genuine. That's what it means to laugh with your teeth. While their eyes block whole eyes, search behind my shadow. Right? Eyes block whole eyes is an example. It's a metaphor, right? And it's, it tells us that these people, they are cold and they are unwelcoming. Their behavior. It also is an example of visual imagery because we can visualize, a, you know, a cold block eyes. But the idea is they wanted to show or to convey the idea that these people, their, their laughter, their interaction is not filled with um, sincerity or even warmth, right? And notice that as they interacted with the persona, notice what they're doing. They're searching behind the persona's shadow, right? And the word shadow there is an example of visual imagery because you not just shadow sorry the searching behind my shadow you can visualize somebody trying to see or search for something right to look behind the persona and the fact that they're looking behind the persona suggests that it's one thing to be communicating with somebody and looking at them face to face but when you actually do it behind them it shows um deceitfulness right it shows that you're really up to no good why is it that when you can go to somebody and ask them something or find out things about them you know just by soul interaction that you're going behind them to find out something right it suggests that these people are up to no good they're searching behind the shadow the word shadow there tells us that they're looking for some dark secret about the persona right and uh, this suggests that no longer do the person as companion that's what the word they laugh with their hearts right they don't show true feeling and sincerity there is now a, a false laugh showing only teeth which we will see later down in line 39 but it is as if they have cold unfeeling eyes boring to the person and even through his shadow trying to dig out any secret he may have okay so in stanza one we um there's an example of repetition the title is repeated there in line one and there's an example of uh contrast what is being contrasted is the true feeling uh of warmth and sincerity versus the insincerity and the false laughter right what happened of the people then versus now there's also example of visual imagery right we can even visualize persons laughing with their hearts because it's you know you can see it in their eyes and there's also the metaphor and those are some examples of words you can use for diction and i always remind you when we're looking at diction you have to identify diction as device then you give the example of the word in the poem you give a definition of the word and the uh, example of how it is used in the poem and comment on how this word aided your understanding of the situation in the poem stanza two begins there was a time indeed they used to shake hands without hearts 
So this is not saying that the persons who interact with the persona or persons long ago um, shake hands um, because they had a heart, a flesh heart inside of them, that organ, right? To shake hands with their hearts, as we said in stanza one, it means that it was done with sincerity and warmth, right? It was felt, it was seen, that when somebody shook your hands, it was genuine, it was because they wanted to do it. They were not forced to do it, okay? So there was a time indeed, and notice the word indeed there, when indeed is used, it's, it's often used to emphasize a statement or a response confirming something that's already suggested, okay, which we, it stands the one that happened. So there was a time indeed, they used to shake hands without their hearts, but that's gone, son. The word but there suggests that, you know, the thing, the, what happened, that thing of shaking hands with heart is a thing of the past, okay? No, no suggests that a contrast is being made. So now they shake hands without hearts. Without hearts uh, doesn't mean that they no longer have that fleshly organ that pumps blood in your body. It's not saying that. It is just saying that what they're doing isn't genuine when, when they shake somebody's hand, right? Um, to shake hands is a, without heart is an example of visual imagery, okay? Because the reader can visualize their sincere and insincere handshake, right? It is also an, a metaphorical way of say of saying that um, something was insincere, hands without hearts, okay? So it can be seen, shake hands without hearts can be used met as a metaphor and it can be used as a visual imagery. Notice that as they shook hands without hearts, Notice that they did this while their left hand searched my empty pockets. Now, um, you know the notion of left and right, right? The word right is usually associated with good, while the word left is usually associated with something that's bad or immoral. So while they're shaking the person's hand, notice the visual Im imagery that, they will, that their left hand will actually be used. So there is, is the case that we know we have two hands. They will use their right hand to shake hands, and the other hand, they will use it to search the person's empty pocket. Right and left there suggests that they're up to something sinister. They're up there up to no good. Right now, empty pockets can. It's easy to think that empty pockets means that the person is poor. Right, this really here is not really to to show that the person is poor, but to suggest that they what they are inquiring or they're finding sneaky ways of knowing um, the person's financial status. Okay, left hand is an example of symbolism and also empty pocket. Right, so it's um, it's a symbolism as it relates to left hands of their search for incriminating evidence against the person. You know, there's some people like that. You know, sometimes you're good, you're really who you are, and they just come to in your life. They try to get to know you in um, quotation, right? But really and truly, what they're there, they're trying, they're there to find out your business, to go and spread, and also to you know construct your reconstruct your identity in a totally different way you know, to actually cause persons to frown upon you, right? So basically that's what they're doing here with the persona. So we know that um, there's an example of alliteration there, which is seen in line two of stanza two, the age in hands and the age in heart is alliterated. And um, it's because the those ages are alliterated, it's really there to emphasize the different manner of handshakes, right? One in the second line of stanza two, it was they shook hands with sincerity, while the, in the other examples, it was not sincere. Okay, it's just as easy as that. And of course, I have outlined here some words you can use for diction. If you can think of any more in stanza two, go right ahead. So stanza three begins. Feel at home, come again, they say. And when I come again and feel at home once, twice, there will be no tries. For then I find those shot on me. So notice the... Stanza three begins with the use of direct quotation, where the persona quotes uh, what was said to him or her, right? And there's this thing where when persons visit other persons' homes, they tend to say, oh, mi casa es su casa, right? In other words, just do as you would do if you were at home, right? Sometimes you ask for someone, oh, go in the fridge, help yourself, you know, you know, feel free to do whatever you want. Right, so that, that's what is conveyed by words like feel at home. So this is what they tell the person now, right? Notice that there's an exclamation mark which comes after feel at home, right? right? It emphasizes the hospital, hospitable words used to make the person feel welcome at their house, right? After that, they will say to the person, come again. 
Also notice the use of this thing a quotation marks, which suggests that the persona said it with sarcasm because he recognized that he was deceived when they said feel at home, they really didn't mean that, okay? Anyhow, they said come again and the person came once, he came twice, but when he went a third time, he found that those were shot on him. And of course, the person would have felt embarrassed, okay, and even disappointed at persons who he would have deemed as friends or even colleagues or even associates, right? Now, notice the metaphor there in the last line of Santa Tree. Those shot on me. Those there can be those there can be seen as opportunities where um, you might um, go to a party, maybe for the sake of net um, networking or creating a network where you will actually garner assistance for your business and even life generally, okay? Where a person will say, okay, you know, come along, I will help you do this and that and so on. So if after helping the person once or twice, when a third time came about, they actually shut the door, they closed the door to um, close off the door from their assistance that they would have been giving the persona. So the person was left by himself even after feeling motivated and feeling encouraged that you know there are friends and people there who won't mind helping me i think sometimes that persons need to use their discretion when they're asking for help yes of course persons will say that you know i will help you anytime come and so on it's not like every day you have to be at these people sometimes you let some time pass before you ask for assistance again however the person felt ashamed and in addition to the sincere happiness and friendliness um, the sincerity of hospitality, it shows that they have been corrupted because um, feeling, feel at home and come again are words of hospitality, but when they are used, they are not used genuinely. They put, they are not sincere. Okay. There's the, in stanza three, there are examples of poetic devices. We have the use of direct quotation, the metaphor, the use of single quotation and the use of exclamation mark there, right? And also visual imagery where the reader visualizes the persona's deception and embarrassment during his or her third visit. And that's answer three. Pay attention to the diction. Of course, you can add any additional words you find necessary to comment on diction. So stanza four says that the persona tells the, the listener is a her son. So I have learned many things, son. So as a result of their hypocrisy, as a result of how I was treated, I have learned some lessons from them, right? Notice that the person who uses the word son just to remind us that he or she is speaking to somebody who's younger than him or her. So I have learned to wear many faces like dresses, okay? That's an example for simile. So faces are being compared to dresses because, you know, put their, uh, persons usually buy dresses for different occasions, right? You will wear a different dress, um, like a wedding dress, a cocktail dress. You know, just to fit these the occasion. That is basically what the person is saying. If I'm attending a formal event, I will have a formal face, a formal um, disposition, a, a formal behavior, right? And notice the person actually gives us an example. Notice the dash there, the home face, office face, street face, host face, and cocktail faces. So there are hypocrites out there. You want to be hypocritical? I too have learned to be hypocritical as well. That's basically what the person is saying. And he says, with all their confirming smile, okay? Now, the word confirming means to comply with rules or standards or law. It can also even mean behaving in socially acceptable conventions or standards, okay? So I will be hypocritical with, with you all and still remain within the rules, okay? Notice with all their conforming smiles, like a fixed portrait smile, that's an example for another a simile as well, right? And it basically tells us that um, what we know about a portrait, a portrait is actually a painting, a drawing, a, photograph, a photograph or an engraving of a person, especially one depicting only a face, okay? So um, whatever face I decide to wear, whether it's a home face, office face, it will be fixed, right? It will be fixed to fit that occasion, meaning that I will not use a home face at the office face, okay? Whatever face I'm using for that occasion is the only one I will keep on, is the only one I will wear until I leave that event, until I leave that place. That's basically what the person is saying. So there's an example of visual imagery. The reader can visualize the, the reader visualizes the different faces adopted by the persona to fit the occasion, right? And those faces there are there in um, coral. <laughs> and the examples of the simile there, where the person has learned to be hypocritical with faces to fit each occasion, right? And some examples of diction, of course. Feel free to add any other word that you deem to be important as well.
So in stanza five, the person is still telling us about the different things he or she has learned. Person says, I have learned to, to laugh with only my teeth. So I have learned to laugh forcefully, you know, in an insincere manner, whether they are funny or not. You know, especially if they tell me, if they give a joke and it's totally not funny, you know, I will just laugh and just using my teeth. <laughs> you know, even though I know that they're dead boring, right? I have laughed, I have laughed with only my teeth and shake hands without heart. So I too have shook hands without sincerity and warmth because, you know, this is how we do it, right? They want to be hypocritical. I have learned to be hypocritical as well. That's basically what the person is saying. And of course, without heart is an example of a, a metaphor as well. And even shake hands with all hearts can, you know, be used as a as visual image as well, where you know they're shaking hands, but you can see that they're just doing it out of formality. It is not done with warmth. The person goes on, person goes on and says, I have also learned to say goodbye when I mean good riddance. Okay, good riddance. When you tell somebody goodbye, and goodbye is actually used to express good wishes when um, part or at the end of a conversation, when one is parting or when one is at the end of a conversation, while good riddance is used to say that one is glad that someone is leaving or that something has gone. Okay, so it's one thing to say, oh, goodbye, right? But when you tell somebody good riddance, you are so happy that they're leaving your presence, okay? It's as if, okay, go ahead. I don't mind you leaving and I'm not looking forward to see you again, right? The person also says um, to say glad to meet you when without being glad, you know? It's like sometimes you meet some persons in town and or wherever, especially persons you haven't seen for a while. Even persons you would see, you know, from time to time and you ask, oh, how are you doing? And the person sometimes, oh, I'm good, you know, and sometimes some persons will just say I'm good because they they, they realize that it was just asked out of form, formality. But sometimes there's some persons who, when you ask, oh, how are you doing? They really want to say a bit more and then the person who asks the question will keep walking. Right, there are times that happened to me and I was like, why did they even ask the question? But it's really just out of formality, okay? So the person says that, you know, I will say, oh, goodbye. And I really uh, mean to tell him good riddance, just go away. <laughs> you know, I don't really want to see you. I don't hope to see you. I'm so happy you're leaving, right? And even when they're talking to somebody, the person will say, I'm glad to meet you. And really and truly, the person is not glad. You know, we are all hypocritical here. And to say, it's been nice talking to you after being bored. So the person has learned how to lie, how to pretend, how to be hypocritical, just as his colleagues were to him, right? And of course, the examples of poetic uh, devices, the visual imagery, the personas, in, it, you can visualize the personas in sincere laughter and handshake, okay? The metaphor is seen there, with it, which is um, in yellow. Um, people used to shake hands with true feelings and the opposite is occurring now. That's an example of contrast as well. And the use of direct quotation. The direct quotation is seen in words like goodbye, good riddance, glad to meet you. And also it's been nice talking to you. Okay, so the person has learned to be insincere and laughed, insincere in laughter, handshakes and polite words. Okay, that's what the, the, those direct quotation, quot quotation tells us. Also, there's a the use of the single quotation markers and even euphemism. The person will say um, goodbye when he means, um, he or she means good riddance also. And of course, there are examples of diction, goodbye, good riddance, glad to meet you. Okay, let's move on to stanza six. Stanza six begins, but believe me, son, but they suggest that the person is saying, I wasn't this way. But I have learned as a result of these people being hypocritical to become hypocritical as well in different occasions by wearing different faces. And even though I have become hypocrit hypocritical, the person is saying in stanza six in line one, but believe me, son, I want to be what I used to be when I was like you. Now, the person is um, very ambitious, right? Because you have already... And you have just admitted to me that you have become hypocritical. How can you unlearn something like that, right? And after telling me that you are a hypocrite, after telling me that you are often engaged in pretense, you are now asking me, who you are calling son, to believe you. That's an example of an irony where the opposite of what is expected happens, right? Where you're expecting somebody, where you, you really do not expect a, a, somebody who is hypocritical or a liar right to actually expect you to trust them it's like for example you taking your you giving a thief your um, your bank account or giving them access to your savings to keep secure you know for sure that you know that money will certainly not be there when you're ready 
okay however the person went on he said that i want to be what i used to be when i was like you that's an example of a simile right the person is comparing um who he is now to um who he would like to be which is like the the son the person who is listening okay so when they and they suggest that this is when the person was considered to be unspoiled honest trusting and sincere and it also um there's an also example of simile in the last line which we'll get to in a while okay and also that's an example that earlier explanation is an example of contrast where um, what is being contrasted is who the person became versus who he wants to be there okay so it's not just a simile and also the person went on and says i want to unlearn all these muting things Notice that when the word unlearn means to discard something, especially a bad habit or a false or outdated information from one's memory. So the person has expressed that really and truly, I want to unlearn all these muting things. Muting things, there is an example for metaphor. These are things that um, silence a person, right? Now, it's very important to note that um, when we consider muting things, these are things that silence a person in this case. Um, silencing sincerity in words, in laughter, and in body language. So the person who calls them muting is, for example, when you, if you are watching TV and you mute it, you know, you know, you will um, end the song, you will no longer hear anything. So the person who wants back um, this voice where he recognizes, he or she recognizes that um, there was a sense of loss of innocence, right? Uh, a sense of um, the person awareness that he is no longer sincere because he's forced to laughing, he's wearing all these dresses when he is in with certain companion, when he's in certain events or occasions, because he has recognized that they're all hypocrites, therefore he or she has become a hypocrite as well. However, he's telling the son that I want to unlearn all these mutant things, all these pretense, all these deception, all these hypocritical ways. These are things that the person is calling mutant because they are preventing him from being a sincere person. The person went on and said, most of all, I want to relearn how to laugh. This is really sad. I, I can't imagine not being able to laugh at times, okay? However, the person recognized that he had the laughs, right? Even he or she, even when, you know, the person laughs, it is not sincere. It is not from the heart. It is not done with heart, okay? And the person confessed that for my laugh in the mirror shows only my teeth, like a snake's bare fang. So when the person looks in the mirror, this is an example of a metaphor and also simile. So when the person looks in the mirror, what he sees by looking at his teeth in the mirror, he's saying he likened them to snake's bare fangs, okay? Now, um, my teeth are like snake's bare fangs. It's an example of, of a simile, right? But comparing, the person is comparing his teeth to that of a, the snake teeth, okay? Um, when somebody calls you a snake, they, they are suggesting or even saying that you are treacherous, you are cunning, you are dishonest. If you even consider the snake in the Garden of Eden, where Eve was deceived because of the snake's treachery, right? The person is even using a snake in this point to show us how hypocritical and how dishonest he or she has become, okay? Now, a snake's um, bare fangs are sharp enlarged teeth positioned along the jaw at the front or rear of a snake's mouth and is connected to venom glands glands okay so basically the person is saying that i have become poisonous not just to others but even to myself and this is one of the reasons i want to unlearn these mutant things this is one of the reasons i want to laugh again this is one of the reasons i want to become genuine and sincere just like you okay notice the exclam use of the exclamation mark to end stanza six um, the person has it suggests that the person has been strongly affected by the image in the mirror so strongly affected because when he looks in the mirror and i have a picture there too you know just in case you don't know uh, you can't and just to help your visualization of the snake fans there right you can imagine that this is what the person is seeing so shocking that he recognizes the boy i need to see a therapist <laughs> but in this case i need to talk to somebody who seems to be genuine and sincere to help me to become who i want to be okay and also the examples of visual imagery, the snake, right? By just visualizing the snake fangs, it reminds us and even tells us and convey the idea that the person cannot be trusted. You already told me that you have become hypocritical and you want me to trust you, right? That, that's also the case. 
And this entire thing is also ironic because the opposite of what is expected happens. The persona is asking a son, the, the older person is asking the younger person to teach him or her to be sincere, even after proclaiming mastery of this honesty. Okay, and there's also some example of diction, muting things, relearn, snake bear fangs, and unloaned as well. Stanza seven begins, so show me son, show me how to laugh, okay? I want to highlight, I will point out the use of the alliteration there in the first line. The S is alliterated in the words so, show, and son, right? When letters are alliterated, you pay attention to the words, right, for the, for the entire word for those letters. And basically, they're just emphasizing the person's eagerness to relearn the mutant things, Eager, eagerness to no longer be hypocritical, to learn once more how to be sincere and warm and hospitable. Okay, to put away his hypocritical ways. That's basically what that's highlighting. So the person is saying, show me son. So the person is still reminding us that he's speaking to somebody who's uh, male and who's younger than him or her. How to laugh. So you imagine this person that doesn't laugh with heart or with sincerity. Okay, his or her laughter is often forced or, out being, or being expressed out of pretense. The person went on and said, show me how I used to laugh and smile once upon a time when I was like you. The use of the word once upon a time, of course, alludes to, you know, the fairy tale that a, a moral is here, right? A lesson is here to be taught. And also it even suggests that the person learning how to be sincere and laughing with hearts. Okay, it seems to be something that's thing of the, a thing of the past and it, it seems as though that is no longer attainable, right? It seems as though the person cannot get back to that point. These are examples of loss of innocence. Right. When we talk about loss of innocence, especially in literature, um, the loss of innocence is often a popular theme in literature and is often seen as an integral part of uh, what they say call coming to age. It is uh, usually thought of as an experience or period in a person's life that leads to a greater awareness of evil, pain or and or suffering in the world around them. So the person has recognized that you know, evil is around him. He has recognized that the hypocritical people live around him or her. And for that reason, he or she decided that I had to come up to their level. I had to be who they are to me in order to survive. And as a result, the person recognized that you cannot go there and not become a different person. Where the person recognizes too that um, he or she has become insincere. He or she cannot be trusted because even when he or she looks in the mirror, he, they cannot recognize themselves. All they see reflecting back to them is a snake or even the fans of a snake, which suggests that they are you now treacherous. They cannot be trusted. They are cunning. They are up to no good. They too will be searching behind other persons back, trying to find out their dark secrets to use them against them. Okay. And we have come to the end of the stanzas analysis. Pay attention to the diction there. Remember, if there are any words in stanza seven that you want to use as well, go right ahead and use them. But when the, the persona uses the, the that those last words, when I was like you, as an example of a simile, right? The persona, this is used when the persona, to refer to when the persona was unspoiled, honest, trusting, and sincere. So now we have come to the end of the stanza analysis. I just wanted to highlight the different literary or figurative devices in the poem. Uh, CXC sometimes asks you questions, uh, especially device questions. Sometimes they ask for figurative slash uh, literary devices, and sometimes they ask for poetic devices. So the literary devices and the figurative devices, they are basically the same. But if they ask for a literary device and you do not know the difference, they tend to give you the, um, the entire question or your answer will be wrong. Okay, so these are, there are a lot more devices, but these are the figurative slash literary devices in the poem. When we talk about poetic devices, we are talking about every poem. So if CXC asks you a question or your, or, your, or your teacher asks for a poetic device, feel free to give any of the devices we would have studied in that poem. But if the teacher or CXC asks for literary devices or figurative devices, you must know the difference, okay? So I just decided to just give you the figurative devices so you can see them. And of course, if the question asks you for a poetic device, feel free to just, you know, place any, give any, any one of them. So these are some of the themes of the poem, childhood experiences. The person spoke about when he or she was a child and how things were simple and persons were sincere and you could have trust persons, okay? That was the experience of the persona. 
um, versus you know what the person uh, um, describes now, right? Um, there's an example of conflicts and complication, the different conflict of people being hypocritical and the person uh, being offended by not reading between the lines and realizing that Yes, of course, you visit people once, twice, but the second time, you know, there's a conflict there where they realize that, no, I, I really want to be by myself and so on. And even that, you know, that complication of who the persona has become as a result of becoming hypocritical and wanting to really learn kindness and sincerity. There's examples of people and desire. The persona desires to um, become who he was years ago, to become sincere, to become warm again, to become hospitable. And there's examples of loss of innocence where the person really realizes that he or she has now learned about evil and pain and suffering in the world around him or her, right? And as a result of that loss of innocence, the person recognizes this and thinks that, you know, if, I, if somebody just teaches me how to become sincere again, I will get back that innocence. But even that seemed to be a thing of the past once upon a time. The examples of hypocrisy of people saying, oh, come again, feel at home. And really and truly, they did not feel that way. Okay. And of course, this the main, I don't want to say the main, but one of the main devices in, not devices, teams in the poem is appearance versus reality, right? Because it's a case where um, before the person associated, we should look at them, the they refer to in the poem, they appear to be friendly. They encourage the person to come to their homes and so on. But in reality, they, they got fed up with the person so they closed doors, they closed opportunities, they closed their house door, they didn't come to see who was knocking. Okay, so basically what, a, what the person sees is really not um, the reality, reality is that people are just fed up with him or her. Okay. And these are some examples of tones in the poem. When we talk about tones, we're talking about the person's attitude towards the subject. There's some sadness in the persona considering how um, he or she, who he or she is at this point and the treatment received by his, by the they in the poem, whether they are his colleagues, his friends or whoever, right? Of course, there's um, persona examples of embarrassment with persona doors being shut in the, on the persona when he visited these people a third time. The person would have felt hurt and there's this longing to, to get back to who he or she used to be in the past, okay, where the person feels that um, if, I be, if, if you teach me to become just like you, I will once again be sincere, I will no longer be hypocritical. And of course, there's some, you know, feelings of, of um, nostalgia, okay, where the person is nostalgic of things in the past when he said, once, once upon a time, son, this is what things used to be. People used to be shake hands with hearts, you know, but now they're shaking hands without hearts. There's this longing to return to the past. And moods refers to how the words used by the person or the words in the poem, how they made you feel having read them, okay? So there's examples of sadness, you know, just for the person, huh? the way how he feels that, you know, because he was shunned, those who are shot in his face, you know, you, you tend to feel empathetic towards um, people who are treated like that. The poem makes me feel reflective, you know, because I, t I tend to look back. I, it made me look back on who I was when I was young and the different things I would have learned about the world, the world, the different things that I would have put in place, having realized that a lot of persons aren't who they say they are. A lot of persons are very pretensive. You know, the different things that I had to do to cope in life, you know, for whether self-preservation or even to protect myself, you know, as it relates to knowing how to treat people, how to interact with people, what to say and what not to say. OK, and of course, I was um, sympathetic, but I, uh, I think the better word is to use is empathetic, you know, because I, 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 it, I have the ability to actually enter into the persona's feeling. Right. And really understand what he or she endure and even the reasons why I understand the reasons why the person um, took that decision to uh, have faces like dresses you know depending on whatever location occasion the person attended that this is how he or she presented himself I, I, I understood the person's reasons right and of course I felt a bit, a bit nostalgic because sometimes um, being an adult, I tend to look back from time to time and just wish for those days when I didn't have to worry about the cares of this world. Okay, so thank you for listening. Check out my other videos, which should be on the screen any second now.